Okay, um, what I'd like to, wow, this is a big room. Um, what I'd like to talk about uh, today is what happens when we go from design to design thinking, and particularly how that might um, apply to healthcare. But I'm going to start off with a, a little bit of a personal journey, uh, and I apologize for this, but it, it helps to explain where I think design is today. Uh, this is the first uh, project I was ever hired to do more than 25 years ago, and for those of you who can't tell, then it's not that obvious, it's a woodworking machine, and I was, I was hired to make it uh, a little bit more attractive, more modern, and a bit easier to use. And I think I did a fairly decent job. Uh, the products went into production, and indeed you can still find them in factories uh, uh, around northern England and uh, today. Unfortunately, you won't find the company that, um, that made them, because they went out of business quite soon afterwards. What I didn't realize at the time was that the problem wasn't so much the future of woodworking machines as the future of the woodworking industry. My next project is a fax machine. And I was asked to wrap an attractive shell around some existing technology. And again, you know, 18 months later, the product was obsolete. And of course, today, the whole technology is obsolete, except for a few doctors I hear still use fax machines. But, um, so it occurred to me that you know, an awful lot of what passes for design was actually not very important. You know, making things look a bit better, a bit easier to use, a bit more marketable. By focusing on a design, I was being incremental, and the impact was pretty small. But this small view of design um, is, I think, a relatively recent phenomena. And it grew in the latter half of the 20th century um, uh, as design became a tool of consumerism. But this was not always the way. And I'd like to suggest that uh, instead of focusing so much on, uh, on uh, products, if we consider design differently and instead focusing, focus on design thinking um, then, uh, as, you know, as a process, then the result will likely be a uh, greater impact. Now, if there are any Brits, well, I know there are at least a couple of Brits in the room because I've met them over, over the last day and a half. Hopefully, you'll recognize uh, this gentleman. Um, his name's Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and he's one of my great uh, design heroes. Uh, and he lived uh, in the 19th century and was responsible for some really great designs during his career, including the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol and the Thames Tunnel at Rotherhithe. Uh, I grew up alongside his most famous creation, which is the Great Western Railway. It runs from London out to the west coast of England and was really the first major railway in Europe. Um, and as a kid, I used to love to pedal my bicycle alongside the railway and wait, wait, wait for the Great Express trains to roar past. I think that's where I fell in love with machines. You can see it represented here in J.M.W. Pa uh, Turner's painting, Rain, Steam, and Speed. What Brunel imagined was building a railway that created the experience for his passengers of floating across the countryside. That's how he express expressed it. And now, in order to achieve that, it meant building the flattest gradients that had ever been imagined for a railway, which meant building long viaducts over river valleys, and this one, in fact, is over the Thames at Maidenhead, and long tunnels, uh, such as the one at Box in Wiltshire. But he didn't stop there. Beyond designing the best railway journey, he imagined, and in fact, created an integrated transportation system where it was possible to embark on a train in London and disembark from a ship in New York. And this is the SS Great Western that he built to take care of the second half of that journey. Now, although this was a century before design became a profession, I believe that Brunel was using design thinking to solve problems and create world-changing innovations. Now, design thinking begins with what University of Toronto Business School Dean Roger Martin calls integrative thinking. The ability to hold opposing constraints and opposing ideas, and from those, create new solutions. You know, in design thinking, this means balancing desirability, what people need, what society needs, with feasibility, what is technologically possible, and viability, what makes business sense, what's sustainable. Now, breakthrough design, like the Great Western Railway, often stretches that balance to the very limit. 
And yet, when we talk of design, and particularly when we read about design in the popular press, you know, we're often talking about products like these. Amusing, yes. Desirable, maybe. Uh, important, probably not. And so somehow we went from this to this. We went from systems thinkers who were reinventing the world to a priesthood of folks in black turtlenecks and designer glasses uh, working on small things. As our industrial society uh, matured, so design became a profession and focused on an ever smaller canvas until it came to stand for aesthetics, fashion, and style. And you know, by the way, I'm a fully paid up member of that uh, priesthood and I even have my, my designer glasses. Um, but I'd like to argue that design is getting big again. And that it is doing that uh, through the application of design thinking to new kinds of problems. Healthcare, what we're talking about today, uh, but also clean water, security, education, and so social welfare. And as we see this reemergence of design thinking as something that can have a significant impact um, and create, uh, create important innovations, we can observe certain characteristics and we can learn from them. And I'd like to share with you uh, some of those, what some of the most elements are and some of the places that they're being applied, uh, in particular in healthcare, uh, over the next few minutes. So the first and most fundamental is that design is human-centered. Uh, uh, it's been talked about already today, this notion of design solving for social need. So it starts with human, uh, with human beings. Um, it may integrate technology and economics, um, but it starts off with what people need or might need, what makes life easier or more, more enjoyable, and what makes technology more useful and usable. But it's more than simply good ergonomics. It's often about understanding uh, context and culture in order to understand how to even think about a new idea. So here, uh, when a team was working on a new vision screening program in India, they were interested in finding out for the, from these kids what excited them, what motivated them, what they were interested in doing with their careers to better understand how they may play a role in screening the eyes um, of their parents. Uh, David Green and Conversion Sound have created uh, an ultra-low-cost digital hearing aid uh, for, the de for developing markets. Now, in the West, these kinds of uh, devices are fitted by highly trained technicians. In places like India, these technicians simply don't exist. And so it took a team working in India with community health workers and patients to figure out how a, a, a PDA application might replace uh, these trained uh, uh, technicians in a diagnostic and fitting service. Instead of starting with the technology, the team had to start with culture and context. Uh, Mark Koska recognized that there was a huge issue around uh, the uh, unsafe reuse of syringes in, in developing countries. Uh, one child dies every 24 seconds as a result of unsafe injection practices. Uh, medical practitioners reuse syringes with several patients or they're not disposed of correctly and they get out onto the street where they use from everything at, from, as water pistols uh, uh, to uh, illegal drugs. So in, but instead of trying to only control the use of existing syringes, he realized that he could make a bigger impact by redesigning the syringe itself um, so that it could not be reused you know, after delivering an injection. And so he developed the K1 auto disable syringe. It was only by stepping back and looking at the whole system that Costco recognized uh, the need and ultimately created the innovation. So if design starts with being human-centered, it moves quickly uh, to learning by making things. Uh, we heard about this idea yesterday, um, from thinking about what to build to building in order to think. Now, prototypes speed up the innovation process because it's only when we get them out into the real world and we start to see how they really behave and we can test them that we learn about them. So the faster we do that, the faster we move our ideas forward, the faster we develop our ideas. Now, much has been said about the Aravind uh, Eye Clinic in Madurai, India. Uh, uh, it manages to treat vast numbers of, of very poor patients by taking the revenues um, from paying patients to cross-subsidize those who can't afford to pay. It's, it's a very, very efficient system. But Aravind is also very innovative. 
what I noticed when I visited um, was, uh, was a willingness to prototype new ideas very quickly um, and, and in order to move them forward. Here is the manufacturing facility for one of their biggest cost breakthroughs. Um, they manufacture their own intraocular lenses, uh, which most of you will probably already know are the lenses that, get, uh, that replace those that are damaged by cataracts. And by doing so, have brought the cost down from $200 a pair to just $4 a pair. And it, it, this was made possible by their prototyping approach. Instead of, in, of, of uh, waiting till they could afford a fancy big factory, they installed, they installed it in the basement of one of their hospitals. Instead of using the large-scale machines uh, used by Western producers, they use low-cost uh, CAD-CAM prototyping technology. They're now the biggest manufacturer of these lenses in the developing world um, and have recently moved, uh, finally, into a custom factory. And much closer to home, uh, we can say that the same culture uh, of prototyping is alive and well here at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the Spark Innovation Center has been recognized as the first design-based uh, research and development uh, lab for health services. And prototyping has been key uh, to the rapid development of innovations uh, such as the first patient use service kiosk and, 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 vi uh, the, and a vision for uh, ambulate, uh, the ambulatory practice of the future. And if human need is the place to start, and prototyping is a vehicle for progress, um, then there are, uh, there are questions also to be asked uh, about the destination. Instead of seeing consumption as being its primary objective, design thinking is beginning to explore the potential of participation. The shift from a passive relationship between consumer and producer to the active engagement of everyone in experiences that are meaningful, productive, and profitable. When Sir William Beveridge uh, created the first of his famous reports in 1942, he proposed what became Britain's welfare state, in which he hoped that citizens would be active participants in their social well-being. By the time he wrote his third report, he confessed that he had failed, and instead created a society of welfare consumers. Now, Hilary Cotton, uh, Charlie Ledbetter, and Hugo Manasai of Participal have taken this idea of participation and in their man manifesto entitled Beverage 4.0 um, have described a model for reinventing the welfare state. One of their projects is Southwark Circle, um, in which a small, num uh, small team of designers uh, worked with local residents in Southwark, South London, um, to create a new membership organization uh, that helps the aged take care of household tasks. The ideas were refined and prototyped uh, in collaboration with 150 older people and their families before the service was launched earlier this year. Now, I think that designing participatory systems uh, in which many more forms of value, um, in addition to, uh, to, to cash, are generated and measured, um, it will become the major theme not only for design, but I actually think for our economy going forward. And we can take this idea of participation um, and uh, to its logical conclusion and say that one of the most effective ways that design can have impact is if design thinking is taken out of the hands of designers and put into the hands of everyone. You'll hear more about this in a little bit, but a team of nurses and practitioners at Kaiser Permanente tackled the, uh, the problem of improving the patient experience. One topic they focused on was the exchange of knowledge between nurses, and in particular the way that they change shifts. Based on a process of observational research, brain brainstorming new solutions, um, and rapid prototyping, the, de the team developed a completely new way of changing shift. Instead of retreating to the nurse's station uh, to tell each other about the various states and needs of patients, uh, they developed a, a method for updating on the ward in front of patients while using a simple software tool. This innovation has brought the time that nurses are away from the patients down from uh, 40 minutes to 12 minutes on average, as well as increasing patient confidence and nurse happiness. And multiplied by all the nurses in all the wards and all the shifts in all the hospitals at Kaiser um, results in, in a pretty big impact. And there are thousands of these kinds of opportunities in healthcare. Oh, excuse me. Um, but unfortunately, good ideas don't sell themselves. The 20th century saw the rise of, an of a whole industry built to tell stories 
to encourage consumers, to, 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 uh, to encourage all of us to consume more. Uh, for those of you who don't recognize it, this is an image from Mad Men. Um, and yet, when the goal is to create not consumption but participation, stories aren't sufficient. We need movements. So it's a, a team of colleagues at IDEO who have been working with, uh, recently with the national campaign to prevent teen um, and unwanted pregnancy. Uh, six in ten pregnancies um, of women aged 20 to 24 are unexpected, and half of all pregnancies in the U.S. are unplanned. So the particular goal of this project was to reduce unplanned pregnancy amongst unmarried adults. And at the core of the service um, is a website and reminder service that acts as a one-stop shop. Um, uh, as a one-stop shop and educational resource. But the core service will only get used if women join the network. So the project included a series of kits and communication ideas to get the message out to col uh, colleges and workplaces. On the left is a poster, um, uh, but on the right um, is a sticker that goes on a mirror in a woman's bathroom. Um, it gets a the point across in a pretty compelling way. Um, you can see it being prototyped here. So only the bottom image is the sticker. The top image is your own. So it gives you a pretty compelling view of what it might be like should, should something unexpected happen. So these are just some of the approaches that design thinking takes and some examples of where it's being applied uh, to the many facets of health. I'd like to go back to Brunel here and uh, propose a connection that may explain why this is happening now and why design thinking might be a, a useful tool. And that connection is change. Times of great change demand new solutions and new alternatives. Brunel worked during the height of the Industrial Revolution when every aspect of our lives and our economy were being reinvented. Now, many of those industrial systems from Brunel's time have run their course and indeed are part of the problem today. But again, we're in the midst of massive change. And that change is forcing us to question many fundamental components of our society, including healthcare, government, education, security. And in periods of change, we need new choices and new ideas because the existing solutions are simply becoming obsolete. We've heard a lot about that in the last two days. But why design thinking? Because it changes the way we tackle problems. Instead of defaulting to our normal convergent approach, where we make the best choice out of existing alternatives, design thinking encourages us to explore new alternatives and create new choices that have simply not existed before. But before we can start that process of divergence, there's an important first step. What's the question we're trying to answer? What is the design brief? Now, Brunel's question might have been, how do I take a train from London to New York? Don't know if it was, but it might have been. But what are the big questions that we should be tackling today? I'm not going to give you time to read this, but these are just some of them that uh, we've been posed over the last uh, months and years. A question that I think is a pretty big one that we're working on right now um, with the Acumen Fund uh, in a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is this one. How might we improve access to safe drinking water for the world's poorest people and at the same time stimulate innovation among lo amongst local uh, pr water providers? Instead of taking a bunch of American designers and coming up with new ideas that may or may not uh, um, be relevant, we took a more open, uh, collaborative, and participative approach. We teamed designers and investment experts up with 11 water organizations across India. And through workshops, they explored new ideas for innovative products, services, and business models. We then hosted a competition and awarded seed funding to five of those organizations. They developed, tested, um, uh, and iterated on their prototypes. IDEO and Acumen spent several weeks uh, with the organizations, helping them uh, design new social marketing campaigns, community engagement strategies, business models, water vessels, and carts for transporting water. 
Now, these early solutions are just getting launched, um, but uh, you know, some, some, of the, some of the early indications are, are, quite, are quite interesting. In one case, um, a, an organization that builds water filtration plants for villages in India has seen a uh, more than fourfold increase in the number of subscribers to this clean water based on a new kind of community um, evening event that was designed as part of this, uh, part of this project. And the same process is just getting underway with NGOs in East Africa. So for me, this is an example of how far design thinking can go from those small projects that I talked about at the beginning of my career. It shows how focusing on the real needs of people, using prototypes to move ideas along quickly, getting the process out of the hands of designers and getting the participation of all of the community um, can, help, can be applied to more important and bigger questions. And just like Brunel, and by thinking about systems, design can have a far greater impact. And so what about healthcare? What are the kinds of questions that we might be asking? There are, of course, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of questions that we might ask. Um, but I'd like to end with a, with a few suggestions, at least they're questions I'd like to have a chance to ask, ones that I'd like to explore um, uh, uh, more deeply. How might we raise a generation of children who have the knowledge, skills, and motivation to take responsibility for their own health and wellness? What happens if we think of health as a life skill to be acquired, not sickness to be avoided? Can technology help get kids interested in health and give them a means to monitor their own progress? What would a health-oriented version of Facebook look like? How can we better illustrate the connection between nutrition, exercise, and health? I think this is an interesting area. How might we increase the sharing of health and medical knowledge between North and South? We can already see from examples like Aravind that there is, that there is exciting innovation. We just heard about it um, from, uh, just, just before me. I mean, that there are exciting innovations going on in the developing world that can inspire us to think differently uh, and, and when we face our own in innovation challenges. The most extreme users often exist in these underserved uh, markets, and it's from these people that we, can, uh, that we can be inspired to come up with the most innovative solutions. Equally, ideas like Mark Koska's auto-disabled syringe you know, show the power of a collaboration between North and South. Um, we have the potential to create measure, immeasurable impact by, by this better collaboration. How do we move the conversation from healthcare reform, which has been a big topic, to healthy living reform? The healthcare debate seems to, be, to, seems to have descended to a pretty narrow topic of universal access, which, although important, um, surely is not sufficient to create um, a sustainable healthcare system. How can we help all citizens take greater responsibility for their own health? Can we use electronic health records as a mean to give all of us more control over how we are served by the medical profession? We've seen some great examples of that over the last day. Can they be used to help join the dots between the healthcare professionals, patients, and our broader lives? And finally, how might we create a new Hippocratic Oath for everyone involved in the healthcare system? The commitment to the livelihood of patients has always stood at the center of, the me of medicine. But as the healthcare system has become ever more complex, it has become difficult to retain that clarity of purpose. Can we create a vision, a sense of purpose, that goes beyond setting the doctor on a pedestal and includes all stakeholders in a shared commitment? Maybe this is not as simple as a new oath. Maybe it's more like a constitution that includes mechanisms for good, government, go uh, good governance. So I'd like to believe that design thinking has the potential to make a difference in healthcare, to contribute new ideas and innovations. But to achieve that, we need to go back to thinking about design in a more expansive way, more like Brunel and less the domain of a professional priesthood. And the first step is to start asking the right questions. Thank you. <laughs>